It's my privilege and my delight as well. Um, it was my privilege and delight this afternoon to meet Andy Crouch. And I'm really happy to be the one who um, was asked to interview him today. As Lisa told you, the book that we're going to be focusing on is his book, Culture Making, Recovering Our Creative Calling. Um, this book won the Christianity Today 2009 award for, book award for Christianity and Culture, that category, and has been uh, honored in many other ways. Um, this afternoon, Andy told me that he was a group of us that he considered himself a journalist. Most of you know, if you were in chapel, that he is also an accomplished musician. He has been an editor and a producer and publisher. He has been a campus minister. And so in various ways, he's living out the um, description of culture maker that is in this book. Um, the book gives us much to discuss today. He told me this afternoon that his favorite part of a, an affair like this is the Q&A with the audience. So I'm going to ask him questions for uh, about 25 minutes or a half an hour, and then I'm going to open it up for you to ask questions. So I hope that's all right. You ready? I'm ready. OK. <laughs> there might be a few out there that haven't read the book yet. So I thought I'd start. That's a beautiful way to put it. I think so too. <laughs> and so I thought I'd start with um, putting out for all of you what I think are the central premises that Andy Crouch lays out at the beginning of culture making. And I have three of them. And I thought maybe he could respond to each of them just a little bit so that you'd get uh, a sense of what his premises are for the argument that he develops. And so the first premise that he lays out in this book is this, I think, that God created us to be cultural beings, to make something of the world. And that phrase, make something of the world, is his phrase. Um, so you want to just comment on that? Sure. My follow-up question, I guess, is when did that, did that start from Eden, or yeah. when? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, this is something that I felt was very important to emphasize, because I think we often don't think this way. I think we Christians often think culture is um, kind of the opposite of what God meant. It's often used in church settings as we talk about the church and the culture. You know, you got this over here. We know the church is of God. What's the culture? There's actually an ad right now <laughs> for a book by a very well-known, very innovative pastor. Uh, and the ad uh, show it's running in Christian magazines, not in the magazine I edit, but others, shows a pair of folded hands. But the hands are wearing like yellow dishwashing gloves or, or protective gloves. But they're folded as if in prayer. And the tagline on the ad says, deliver us from culture. Now, this is quite extraordinary. It's quite an arresting. It's a very well done ad. It gets your attention. It makes its point. And my question when I read this ad was, what would happen if God answered this prayer? Where would he deliver us to? <laughs> Where would we be once we were delivered from culture? Because human beings are meant for culture. It was God's original intention. And you mentioned Eden. But that, of course, is uh, the second creation story. Chapter 2 of Genesis, it's even in chapter 1, where the image bearers are asked to till the earth, keep it, fill the, fill the world, um, have dominion over the world. And all of those are just ways, I think, of, of identifying what we call culture, which is human activity in the world. And that was always meant to be. OK. Second premise is this, that all people participate in culture. You've already sort of gone there. And not only that, but all people uh, are culture makers, whether they want to be or intend to be or know that they are. We are all culture makers. Yeah, and with that, what I was trying to do was to solve one of the problems when you talk about culture, which is people think it's something only some people do. So 
they think, well, culture is what artists do, you know. Um, or they think culture is high culture. It's what people who go to art museums do. But they don't think of it as, you know, McCann's coffee, uh, you know, auditoriums, chairs, uh, plumbing. And I wanted to write a book that my plumber could read. And, and I, I see my plumber more often than I would like, actually. And uh, <laughs> he's a great guy. Uh, he's a very expensive guy. but. Um, Michael is his name. And as I was writing the book, I was thinking, I do not want, I, I knew I would eventually give Michael a copy of this book. And I thought, I do not want to give Michael a book about culture that doesn't include plumbing. Uh, because then that would suggest that culture was some subset, something that maybe the creative class does. And that's, and so I, I did give Michael the book. <laughs> and fortunately, I haven't needed to call the plumber uh, in about a year. So I'm not sure what he thinks about it. Uh, but if he reads it, I think he'll find his work in it. Because the point is, Plumbing is making something of the world and something very important. Uh, I am really grateful for plumbing, actually, uh, and for the excellence with which he does his work. So it's all culture, not just a subset, not just a one component. Uh, when you see human beings tending the world and creating new things in the world in any domain, that's culture. OK. Number three. And this okay. is actually language from the book. It's kind of a two, be, two, two for one. What you call that? But two for one in here. So if you if you'd respond to both sides of this premise, first is um, and again this is a quote from the book that culture requires a public, mm. and the second is that it requires shared goods, and I'm especially interested in the, the two words public and goods, and if you'd sort of unravel what all that might mean. Yeah. That would be helpful, I think. Wow. Yeah, so the, one of the ideas I wanted to get us thinking about is that culture is always shared, which is to say it, it always has a public. So public can be a relatively large group. It could be a relatively small group. We have a relatively small group in the room. And right now, we're actually creating a shared good. We're having a conversation. But it's not a private conversation. Actually, earlier in the day, you and I sat down at the college and we had a private conversation. But that conversation, by itself, had no way of shaping the culture of the, of the public in this room, because no one heard it. You have no idea what we talked about. We talked about you, of course, but we're not going to tell you what we said. Um, so it's only when a conversation like this is held in front of a group of people, and then they're invited into it, that it really starts to shape the culture, and, and by which I mean if we have a good conversation, and we say things that are actually helpful, and people ask questions that elicit helpfulness, we all might go out and actually do something slightly different, make something slightly different of the world because we were here. And that's what we would aspire to. Uh, if we fail, then we'll all go out and nothing will change. But we hope, actually, that the culture of, of Indiana Wesleyan, the culture of our own lives, will be shaped by it. But that only happens when it's shared. And I like this word goods, cultural goods, um, because the other problem we have with culture, we tend to think it's fine art or high culture or something only creative people do. We also tend to have this, these very disembodied ideas about what culture is. So for example, we think culture is about a worldview, which is a language that comes up sometimes, or ideas. And the thing is that um, ideas don't change the world until they're embodied. They don't change culture until they are written down or spoken, or sung, or acted in some way, some body, uh, some body, and somebody <laughs> has to actually create something based on the idea. Even if it's as simple as me moving sound waves through the air, using my vocal track, hitting your ears, we are making something in the world right now. And uh, that's a good. Speech is a kind of cultural good. Um, words are cultural cultural good when written down. But culture is not just disembodied stuff. People talk about you know, water and fish. If there were a goldfish sw swimming around in here, would the goldfish know that the goldfish is in the water? And they say, ah, it's what culture's like. It's sort of all around us, but we never see it. It's all around us, and we don't necessarily notice it, but it's very tangible. It's not just ideas. It's goods. It's coffee. It's chairs. It's buildings, language, poetry. Uh, but it's actual stuff people have made not just some disembodied thing. And Christians are strangely into disembodiment, given that we believe in incarnation. We, we talk about 
spiritual things, as if spiritual things would be the highest category of things. When in fact, when God creates the world, when he says it's very good, it's once there's all these thing things in the world, not when there's just spiritual things in the world. I want to just ask you in just one more little trail of that. Yeah, yeah. So when you talk about language, and when you talk about spoken language, um, but, you're, but you're eliminating from what we're discussing here with culture, the conversation that was just between you and me, mm-hmm. because that's not public. Two people's not public. Right, two people I would say is not really public. Now, there's a, so culture happens a whole bunch of scales, right? So my wife and I have a culture of our marriage, you could say. We have yeah. a way of making something of the world. And of course, when the two of us talk, that shapes the culture of our marriage. So in that sense, it would. But it doesn't shape it for a wider public and, until we create something that's shared with other people. Okay, yeah. okay, great. Sometimes when we hear about culture, especially um, in the generation uh, that's best represented out here, um, we automatically think of technology, especially when we talk about newly created goods. We often go to the whole idea of technology. And in fact, um, when you talk about uh, culture changing goods in your book, you mention the um, iPod. And so we think about that automatically. Um, But I want you to comment on um, a little section in your book. You say this. I think it's really brilliant, but I want to ask you about it a little bit. So you say the. It's encouraging when brilliant people say things like that. (laughs) You say the record of technology as science, relieving human beings of specific burdens and diseases, is splendid. The record of technology as science is splendid. The record of technology as a metaphor for being human is disastrous. When technology is used to win wars, it becomes the atomic bomb. When it is used to control human sexuality, it becomes the destruction of millions of unborn lives. And in contraception, all too often fosters the disengagement of fruitfulness from love. The biggest cultural mistake we can indulge in is to yearn for technological solutions to our deepest cultural problems. Well, I want to ask you what you think our current deepest cultural problems are, and if you see us tempted toward trying to find solutions through technology, Uh and give us the warning once more. Sure. Well, um, all right, let me name a couple. One of our deepest cultural problems uh, is how to allow people to fruitfully work in the world. Human beings are made to work in the world. And human economies are imperfect in that they don't provide enough opportunities for fruitful work. Now, the the technical word for this, the technological word for it, is unemployment. The temptation is, when you have a problem like unemployment, we've got maybe 15%. I mean, the the official number is lower, but for reasons some people know, it's a lot more than the 7.8 or 7.9. You've got 15 to 20% of the population who cannot find fruitful work. The temptation is, as a people, to look to our leaders and say, we want a technological solution, by which I mean something, we need you to fix some levers. Uh, There's some dials that need to be turned by people who have their hands on the dials at the Federal Reserve or Congress or someone. We want you to turn the levers so that we output more jobs. We want jobs. Job is a very thin word. (laughs) Uh, What people are actually yearning for, I think, is fruitful work. But what we ask our leaders for is just jobs. And we expect, we wish that our leaders could work like our microwave works, which is I want heat. So I push a button and I get heat. And if it doesn't work, I get the microwave repairman and they fix it. The problem is the question of how to have fruitful work is not a technological question. And I think we're asking our leaders to provide, we we wish that they were like the, the oven repairman who would just fix the economy. The economy is made up of all these image bearers, fallen image bearers, 
who in, in the ways they interact are failing to create the conditions for thriving. And that is not something you fix with technical solutions. But our, our public is very eager for those kind of technical solutions. Uh, you want to go a level deeper? Our, our culture's, one of our culture's deepest problems is loneliness. Um, when, my, when friends of mine come from other parts of the world to the United States, consistently when I say, what do you most notice about the US? They say, I notice how lonely people are. Uh, which is something I had never noticed about my own culture <laughs> until friends from other cultures came and made that observation. So how do you solve the problem of loneliness? Well, if you're a kind of, kind of awkward but very bright Harvard undergrad in about 2004, you create this website well, let's, let's get even more specific. You know what one of our deepest problems is? How will boys and girls get along, right? So say you're this awkward Harvard undergrad trying to figure out how to relate to girls, right? And you're lonely. Um, <laughs> you create a, a website to rank girls on whether they're hot or not. Put it up, get all your friends to contribute. You iterate a few times, you end up with this thing called the Facebook. And it's basically a way to try to solve the problem of loneliness without having to have actual relationships. <laughs> now, I'm not saying that's the only way to use Facebook, but it is a technological solution to, to the basic human problem of how do I make and keep friends, which is not susceptible to a technological solution. <laughs> and then, what, final part of my answer, what's the deepest human problem? Now, loneliness and uh, lack of jobs are maybe sp somewhat specific. But the deepest human problem is suffering. Why do we suffer? How is it possible to prevent suffering? No. <laughs> um, but in our society, what we have decided to do is entrust this to a highly technologized approach to medicine. And we treat medicine, what we want doctors to do is to fix us. But doctors cannot even come close to addressing the deep human problem, which is suffering. Uh, and actually, if you ask them to, you will, you will damage them. It's damaging to be a doctor who's expected to be a suffering fixing device because there's no way to do it. So fruitful work, loneliness, and suffering are things that our technology cannot solve. OK, I'm going to continue with um, something that I think uh, the college student generation is thinking about, especially the college generation on this campus. Movies. Oh, and yes. yeah, yeah, we like movies. And the um, in your discussion of how we not only need to uh, create culture, but before we can even think about creating culture, we have to cultivate culture. Um, we have to um, take care of the good things that are in the culture that we have and also um, learn about, in every way we can, the existing culture. At IWU, we have a general policy. We require that our students refrain from viewing R-rated movies. Hmm. And many of us. In so NC-17 is fine, but R-rated is out. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's <all> right. <laughs> it, was, it was just like a volleyball hitting. I just. Yeah. Um, many of us in the community are ambivalent. Ah. That's a euphemism, but <laughs> ambivalent about the wisdom of this. Huh. And it seems to me that what you say in your book about um, being cultivators of the culture that we are born into. Uh. All of these two, even I, was born into a culture where movies were a part of the general culture and right. that we have all been exposed to. And so, it's a practical question. Wow. Do you have any advice wow. for us as an institution, a Christ-centered institution, in thinking about how to, um, how to think about this? Yeah. And how to, if we believe it's not the best course, um, change the culture? Yeah, wow. Wow, thanks for that easy question. <laughs> 
You knew it was coming. Uh, <laughs> yeah, now this is a truly complex thing. Because on the one hand, uh, let's see, how, how would we approach this? On the one hand, I think the great gift of places like this is that they attempt something that people in our society have almost given up on, which is real community. Uh, and real community requires boundaries um, and choices about who we want to be. And what our society tends to settle for is sort of very minimal levels of tolerance, because no one can even imagine agreeing on what boundaries we'd set. And so we create these very flat, empty spaces as communities. Um, and I think a great strength of communities like this is that they make choices about who we want to be. So the first thing I'd say is if you find yourself feeling friction with this policy, if I were trying to challenge it, let's say, because I sense that some might want, might feel like it's, we need to challenge this in some way. The first thing I would try to do is not challenge it in a way that, that undermines uh, the very great good of a community that actually makes choices about a way to live together. You know, a, a parallel example, maybe slightly less freighted, is alcohol consumption policies. Once you're of age 21, you can legally drink. But at many schools like IWU, I don't know if it's a policy here, but at many schools like this, you, even if, uh, if you're an undergrad, even if you're of age, you, you're, you abstain from alcohol. I actually think that's an incredibly healthy thing. Um, I have no problem with drinking alcohol. Um, God willing, I may do so later this evening uh, when I get to my next stop. Uh, and I, I'll, <laughs> not here, uh, in Chicago, the big bad city to the northwest. Um, uh, no problem with it, but I think there's a lot to be said in a community like this, partly because some people are underage, to just say, as a community, we choose not to do this. So I actually think this is of the essence of Christian community, that I don't use all of my freedoms. I think that's actually essential, and that's a very healthy thing. So the first thing I want to do is figure out, okay, suppose I want to agitate to change this policy. Well. I would want to do it in a way that says I'm, we are still committed to having certain common commitments that, that abridge some of our freedoms for the sake of everybody flourishing. And we need to figure out what those are. Now, R-rated movies. And the cultivation of culture. Yeah. Yeah, this is an issue because, first of all, the R rating is a very blunt instrument. It lets through a lot of things you should never spend your time on, and it filters out a lot of the most worthy things being produced. So that is a real problem, because there is some horrid stuff being produced with G ratings that could be shown any night of the week in this theater, according to this policy, but which is deeply not, I mean, either damaging or simply distracting and, and diffusing of real image-bearing energy. Uh, most of the stuff that, well, uh, uh, the point isn't to get specific. However, I'll, I'll say Pixar is, is a, a glorious exception to this. They, they make such extraordinary G-rated movies, and they do a really good job. But when you go to Pixar and you watch the trailers for the movies before the Pixar movie, you see the most inane stuff that is so demeaning. I mean, it, it's the formula for children's films in our time before Pixar and still no one outside of Pixar seems to have gotten the, the memo. The formula is you have stupid, kind of gross jokes that kids will laugh at, and adults find kind of petty or petty, silly. And then you have sexual innuendo that goes over the kid's head and that the adults find funny. And this is what like every DreamWorks film is. And it's, it's so demeaning to human beings to make them laugh at that stuff. The genius of Pixar is that they decide not to do humor that way. And we can talk more about Pixar, maybe. Um, <laughs> but the, the problem is the rating does not tell you, is this worth my investment of energy? And, and then conversely, there are things being made with an R movie. I think of some of Terrence Malick's films that have, I assume have an R rating because of their uh, un, unblinking depiction of violence and war. The Thin Red Line, for example. I don't know how you can be serious about film in America and not have seen The Thin Red Line. Uh, it's a very, very important 
film in the genre of World War II films. It makes a very important statement as a profoundly religious film, though not necessarily a Christian film. So <laughs> we'd have to find a way, wouldn't we, of proposing something that would honor, I think, what is at the heart of it, which is we do not want to be wasting our time as a community on things that don't build up. And I have something more to say about that in a second. But but that would allow us to discern what's excellent even if it's troubling. And even if it portrays things that are that fall short of our own ideal. And this is where I'm I'm want to walk back what I said about building up, because the truth is to meet our culture where they're at, some of us need to engage with some of the culture that really doesn't build up and isn't very adequate, but that you need to know about if you're ever going to make a movie. So those of us who are going to actually make or critique movies need to have a vocation to go places that others of us for leisure and entertainment probably should not go. And that's an important distinction. So uh, here's, here's the thing. The Pharisees think uh, holiness is about where you are. If you're in certain places, you're not holy. If you're in other places, you are holy. So a Pharisaical approach to alcohol, for example, is if you're in a bar, you're in trouble, right? Jesus has a totally different way of approaching it, I think. He asks, what's your heart? Or another way to put it is, why are you there? Why are you in the bar? <laughs> and so two people, two Christians can be in a bar, one to use alcohol to medicate away their own sense of loneliness, suffering, anxiety, whatever, and the other there uh, to form friendships, uh, to enjoy conviviality, to celebrate life and in the presence of God. Both of them can be having the same drink in the same bar and be having a very different experience, which I think ought to be judged differently. So the last thing I would say is I think it might be helpful to talk about a distinction between what do we entertain ourselves with? Because there is a lot that holds itself out for entertainment that actually is quite damaging. That actually, if you were watching it as part of your vocation, as a, as a responsible growing, someone growing into responsibility, you actually would go and watch that, but not as leisure. Is that? help at all but we're gonna have to we'd have to find a way to do it as a community I think the mistake would say oh we'll just tolerate anything watch anything you want I don't I think we should aim higher than that as Christians we should care about what we watch but not in ways that make the pharisaic pharisaical division where it's what goes into your eyes or your uh, mouth that makes you unclean I was um, thinking about this in connection with your um, chapter on um, gestures and postures mm. and I don't think it's exactly mm. the right analogy yeah. but it seems like gestures have more to do with individual decisions yes and posture has to do with taking a stand like yeah. um, which may or may not be a good stand yeah. but you have to ask the question is this a good stand and so I think that's what we're all asking. Is yeah. this a good stand? What is the yeah. value of it? And if it's not a good posture, yes. perhaps we should revert back to gestures that have to do with, right. um, but there's, there are a lot of movies out there. So huh. one, one of the- th No, that's one, right. Yeah. Yeah. There and are a lot of R-rated movies. You know, so here's another thing. Think about that ad I mentioned with the gloved hands, right? The other thing that's going on in that ad with these cleaning gloves <laughs> is this idea that the world is gonna contaminate you. If you took off the cleaning gloves, you'd get dirty. Mm -hmm. And I sometimes show this ad to, to folks uh, when I'm speaking about this, and I show these gloved hands. And then the next picture I show is a kid who's been playing in the dirt, and he's, he's holding up these really dirty hands with a beam of delight on his face, like, look, Mom, I've been playing in the dirt. And now, from a mom's point of view, you could look at him and say, ah, you're, you're dirty. You know, don't touch the walls, right? Um, but why is it that when our kids play in the dirt and do exactly what we put on gloves to prevent, that is, they get their hands all dirty, why don't we worry about them unduly? Why don't we you know, worry particularly? We worry they might get something dirty, but we don't worry about them. Well, it's because they have immune systems, right? So one question is, how do we create the kind of immune system that allows us to be dug into the world with all of its complexity, all the stuff that's in the soil. I mean, there's bacteria in the soil, there's viruses in the soil, there's wonderful fertile organic matter in the soil, there's seeds in the soil. It's all mixed into the soil. You got a garden, you're gonna dig in that stuff. What's going to make you able to do that healthy? It's having a healthy immune system. 
so that when something comes in or, or comes into proximity with you and you're like, oh, that's, that's not healthy, you have the means to, to you know, reject it and say, that is not going to help me grow as an image bearer. But you're able to still dig. And, and actually, of course, one of the things that we suspect, I'm not sure it's proven, but we suspect that part of why we're getting all of these um, uh, complications of the immune system like asthma and, and allergies and so forth now is that we're actually preventing kids from digging in the dirt, literally. That we, we've created this whole antimicrobial environment, literally in our world, that's preventing their immune systems from ever becoming functioning. Well, I feel like the same thing can happen in Christian communities, is we try to just wall off all of this stuff. Um, and then we never develop the healthy ability as we grow up, and this happens developmentally, it's different when you're seven, when you're 17, when you're 27, to say, that's not healthy for me, I choose, I don't choose that. Um, rather than, oh, I never touched that, so the moment it comes into contact with me, I'm completely taken over by it. So I'd err on the side of digging in the dirt, to be honest. It's a great analogy, I think so. Mm. One more question, okay. you, can, you can answer it as, um, with as much length or shortness as you wish. <laughs> oh, Again, when it's over, then we'll turn it over to the questions in the audience. Great. And just, would you give us one good example of a um, successful culture maker in contemporary society oh, we wow. might recognize? Wow, one good example. Mm -hmm. Well, everyone always says Bono, so I'm not going to say Bono. Um, <laughs> no, he's pretty, pretty amazing. I've never seen anyone else lead 50,000 people singing Amazing Grace uh, as the climax of a rock concert. Um, oh, you know, why don't I say Andrew Stanton, because we talked about Pixar. So Andrew Stanton's the writer-director of uh, Finding Nemo and Wally. -E. And let's let him stand for the whole cadre of Christians working at Pixar the only studio with a significant number of Christians in senior leadership. Even though Pixar is not a Christian company <laughs> at all, um, founded by Steve Jobs, actually founder of Apple, who strangely hired a lot of Christians at both Apple and Pixar. Steve Jobs himself not a Christian, but he kept hiring them in senior positions. And what I think is amazing about Andrew Stanton's work and his colleagues uh, is a couple things. First, they redefined a genre. Children's films were this combination of gross jokes and sexual innu innuendo jokes. That was the formula. Uh, and they were just bad. And you didn't, if you were an adult, you only went because your kids wanted to see it. Pixar said, let's make movies for everyone. And they made excellent movies. And their movies made a lot of money, <laughs> which I think is a very good thing because if you make money, you get to do it again. Uh, and they've been able to do it sustainably. Um, they also incorporated technology in a brilliant way. So they took all, we were talking about technology, they took all this technology and they put it at the service of stories that always are about the question, what is it to be human? Every Pixar film is about the question, what is it to be a human being? Even when it's about a robot or a rat that wants to be a chef or whatever, or a fish. It's about human being. And they take all this technology, and instead of the technology kind of taking over, like it does in sort of standard issue CGI, oh my gosh, I, I happened to run across the last few minutes of uh, Star Wars number two, I think it was. The one that begins with, actually, what is my kind of favorite line? Yoda says, begun this Clone War has, which is actually a great final line of a movie. Um, but it's so laden, like loaded down with just terrible CGI. And that it's just totally taken over the movie, and any semblance of human being has been leached out of George Lucas's world because he was able to do all this technological stuff. Pixar, folks like I understand, took the same technology, actually same exact stuff, developed in, corporate, in cooperation with Lucasfilm, and use it to tell these profoundly human stories. So great. And then it's, he makes movies that aren't Christian uh, in the sense that they don't say Jesus, and they don't have the gospel like you know, spelled out in Act 3, Scene 6. But they just are filled with this kind of humane vision of what it is to be a person. And I just think that's the kind of culture making we need times 20,000. Um, and, and there are many people who are growing up doing that now in Hollywood because people like Andrew Stanton sort of paved the way for it. Um, now, I, I want to say, because of the GR rated thing, 
the thing is we don't just need it done in one genre of family films. We now, you know the film, the film genre we desperately need Christians making films in is romantic comedy. Romantic comedy is the wasteland of film right now. <laughs> I'd rather go to a DreamWorks Chipmunks film than your average <laughs> romantic comedy, you know, um, because it is, it's such a truncated vision of what love is, what uh, sexuality is, what male and female are, and we desperately need some people with a rich, biblical, humane vision of what it is to be a, a person in love that would tell some of those stories. And there's no reason romantic comedy couldn't be reinvented super profitably the way that Pixar reinvented uh, family films. And same thing with war movies, same thing with, with fantasy, with horror, every genre there ought to be people saying, what does it mean to create image-bearing movies in these genres? Great. There's my okay. one example. Okay. We're going to um, open it up now f for questions from you all. Are, are we assuming that they're go he, the questioners are going to come to the microphone? Is that, there's a mic. Okay, there's a mic on either side. So if you come, you can walk up, and then we won't have to call on you. Don't be shy. Go first. Meredith's going to be brave. No, there's somebody else. Ren, go, Ren. Okay, so you've talked about um, how to engage with culture um, with like the movie thing, um, where if you are trying to um, like make a better movie, then you like engage with ones that maybe aren't as beneficial and uplifting. So, how do you engage with like what kinds of questions would you ask about engaging with culture that um, to decide whether it's something that is going to be like beneficial to you? or whether it's going to um, be negative, yeah. like a Chipmunks movie. <laughs> like the Chipmunks movie. Uh, that's a wonderful question. Well, I'm a little reluctant to give like rules, because I, I mean, rules are good. They're like training wheels. But ultimately, it's about discernment. It's, and ultimately, it's about deciding. The truth is, it's, it's, here's what it's really about. <laughs> It's about deciding, I want to be, if you were in chapel, I want to be a Psalm 1 kind of person. I want to be a person who's meditating on the law of the Lord day and night and is not walking, lingering, sitting in such a way that I become scornful. And I want to be a flourishing tree. <laughs> to be honest, if you decide that's what your life is about, I'm not that worried about what you watch or don't watch or consume or don't consume. Augustine said, love God and do what you will. <laughs> And if he didn't say it, he should have said it. It was somebody like that. <laughs> Augustine, Luther, Mark Twain, I don't know. Um, uh, the truth is, if, if in your heart of hearts you have not decided you want to be a tree planted by streams of water, no rules I can give you will protect you. And if you have decided, I am on a path, the Catholic way of putting this would be, I'm on the path to being a saint <laughs> by God's grace. I want to be someone who is, and this is, by the way, not just Catholic. This is a very Wesleyan holiness way of putting it. Uh, if you're on that path, even if, you know, if I fall off the sidewalk into the ditch and I get muddy, I go home and I clean myself up. I don't live in the ditch because I want to be on the sidewalk. Like, if you make a mistake and you realize, whoa, I never should have watched that. I shouldn't have read that book. I shouldn't have, whatever. You'll, you'll clean it off, you'll pray if necessary, you'll get a few friends to pray with you, and it'll be done. Uh, so the real question is, who do you intend to become? <laughs> and on, to be honest, I think that's the only question you deeply have to ask. Now, there are other questions about how we do this in community, where we're all at different stages, and some of us haven't really made up our minds. Do I really believe God's that good that I'm willing to give up everything else? Um, and then in community, maybe we set some guardrails. But for yourself, that's the question. That's why I would say. Thank you. Thanks. Yes. Uh, this morning in chapel, you talked a lot about music, and you played music on the piano and talked about the cello and the CD. My question is, in your opinion, do you feel that Christian musicians focus too much on creating a project that reaches the Christian audience huh. rather than focusing on creating something that will appeal across the different cultures and that could positively affect both Christians and non-Christians alike? Yeah, great question. Well, you've identified, I think, one of the hardest things about being a musician today 
And it's the temptation to make your music for an audience. It's to, it's to be a musician who thinks like a marketer. Because what I heard you say, and I totally understand why you put it this way, because it is a very common way of thinking, is are we creating stuff that will appeal to this audience or to appeal to a wider audience? The moment you're creating work to appeal to an audience, you've stopped being an artist and you're now a jingle writer. And you're either a Christian jingle writer or a secular culture jingle writer. And of course, it is fine to become a jingle writer if God calls you to be a jingle writer. But I'd rather that you know you're a jingle writer and work for Madison Avenue than call yourself a musician. Because what a musician ought to do is take the musical traditions that they have apprenticed themselves to and become expert in and use them to tell the truth the way they see it, as beautifully and as expertly and innovatively as they can, and faithfully as they can, and not worry about who it appeals to. And the truth is, the best people are doing exactly that. Uh, so Mumford & Sons, who are people who come out of Christian faith, I don't know every detail of their spiritual lives. I don't know if they watch R-rated movies or not. <laughs> what I know is that when Marcus Mumford writes about the human experience, it is so deeply shaped by his growing up in a Christian home that the gospel flows through it. And I guarantee it's not because Marcus Mumford was trying to decide, how do I fit in a little bit of Christian message to get the Christian audience, but also keep the secular audience engaged by saying the word, mm, uh, you know, in, <laughs> in my most popular song. It, it, he doesn't work that way because he's actually working as an artist. And so the first thing the artist has to do is stop trying to please an audience. That doesn't mean you don't pay attention to who's listening. You love your audience, but you don't try to appeal to your audience. It's a very subtle difference. So if, if you, so I think of um, someone I'm privileged to call a friend, Sarah Groves, um, who writes incredible music, uh, happens to mostly reach Christian audiences because of the way she approaches it. God bless her. I love her music. Uh, I love what Mumford & Sons is doing. I love what U2 does. I, you know, a lot of people making different kinds of music, but they're doing it honestly. And if, if you end up reaching one particular audience, if you end up only reaching people with lots of facial hair and who wear berets, that's fine. If, if you're being truthful and faithful in your music making. That's how I would think about it. Thank you. So with all this talk about making and sharing cultural goods, how does this vision relate to consumerism? <laughs> Ooh, great question. Wow, I'm so glad you asked. Uh, so anything, anytime something becomes an ism, we're in trouble. All right? uh, isms and isations. Whenever you find yourself in the realm of isms and isations, something's gone wrong, take, turn around, check your GPS, because you're actually involved in some kind of idolatry, usually. Um, and you've gotten away from real life, and you're now living a, a pseudo life. So consumerism is the pseudo life based on the pattern of consumption that I talked about this morning in chapel, where you just keep buying satisfaction. Now, I actually think consuming is a crucial part of being human. Uh, I happen to be consuming tea right now. <laughs> I'm going to consume dinner. Uh, you all, some of you consumed, not a great word, but you consumed my book, we might say. You, you read my book, right? Ezekiel actually did consume a book, right? Um, <laughs> consuming is part of the cultural story. It's where you make something, and I say, I say, echoing the creator with you, I say, that's good, or maybe that's very good. I want to share in that. I actually want to pay for that so that you can keep doing what you're doing. This is a healthy thing. Consumerism is the idea that the good life comes always and only through the purchasing of other people's creativity. So other people make the music, and I press play. The intro ah, I, see, I didn't have time to say this in chapel, but now you're magically giving me the chance to say what I didn't have time to say in chapel, which is the other thing Jesus said that I oft never understood, which was those who have given up houses, lands, mothers, fathers, brothers for my sake and the gospel will receive it back now in the present time a hundredfold and in the age to come. So a very odd thing to say. Like you give it up and you'll actually get it all back. And this is how I see this purchases practices thing. If you build your life on purchases, consumerism, and all you ever get is satisfaction in what you consume, you will never know the satisfaction that comes from uh, playing the violin, the life of practices. You'll never even imagine what that's like. But it does not work the other way around. 
if you lose your life in order to save it and build your life on practices and do these difficult things that lead to you becoming a different kind of person, you actually then can go and listen to music and it's so much richer for you than for the person who just consumes music, just presses play. So my son who plays the violin listens to classical music and he hears all these things in it that I don't hear because of, because of the instrument he plays. He, he, and he takes joy in it in a way that I can't because I'm just a consumer of, say, violin sonatas. But my son plays violin sonatas, and then when he listens to them, he gets much more joy out of them. So you live the life of practices, you actually get all the purchases thrown in for free. You consume all you want. Again, love God, do what you will. Build your life on this, you'll get all this other stuff. Build your life on purchases, you'll never get the life of, of practices. So consuming is a great gift. I celebrate that I get to consume, but I don't build my life on consuming. I'm not a consumer. I'm an image bearer. Hope that helps. Uh, two questions. What is at the core of being an image bearer? <laughs> and did you intentionally use the number 10,000 this morning in chapel? You said ah, 10,000 hours. 10,000 hours. Yeah, I'll answer the second question first. The 10,000 hours idea comes from a, a Swedish uh, scientist who I'm sure has Ericsson in his name somewhere, but I can't remember exactly <laughs> his name. But you can easily look it up. Um, it is actually from the study of expertise. This, there's been quite a bit of work done. Malcolm Gladwell has popularized it, others have, that suggests that it takes about 10,000 hours of concentrated practice to master any complex cultural discipline. Uh, so at eight hours a day, that's about four or five years. So think about learning a language. If you moved to another country, immersed yourself, eight hours a day, we're speaking the language. After four or five years, probably, you'd, you'd have a certain level of proficiency. Um, so it works that way for music. It works that way for surgery. It works that way for business. It works, it's very generalizable. It seems. So that's where that comes from. Uh, what, what, what is at the core of being an image bearer? <laughs> Well, this, there's been a lot of conversation about this. What does the Imago Dei mean? The church has had lots of ideas. And I think they all have some truth. At the core is, I suppose, Genesis 1. OK, so when we first see the phrase, and it's one of the only times we see the phrase, in the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. What do we know about God? What, what data do we have as of Genesis 1.26? Well, God creates. God takes what is formless and adds form. So I think that's image bearing. God does this in the plural, let us make. Very odd, odd thing to have in a monotheistic text. And right there in, in Genesis is an us. So to be an image bearer is to be in relationship. God celebrates. Uh, the work of God's hands is good, 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 ver ultimately very good. So uh, what to be an image bearer is to participate in the creation of good in the world. And then we might throw in, slightly after 126, God rests. Uh, on the seventh day, God doesn't just work, work, work. God actually s sits back, reigns, and rests. And so to be an image bearer is to not be a slave of the gods, not be someone who's always under the gun to work, but to be one who's able to sit and rest and, and enjoy. Uh, the goodness that God has created. So those would be maybe some of the things we learned from Genesis 1 at least. Hi. Um, for some of us, uh, graduation is right around the corner. Um, ah. and as we're leaving um, this Christian community and moving to more diverse communities, um, is there a way or should we look to integrate our own um, cultural standard um, to those different than ourselves? Ah. Well, they won't let you, so don't worry about that. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, there's a lot for it to be said for this Pauline image of resident aliens, right? People who are citizens of one country and live in another. And I feel that way, living in Swarthmore, Pennsylvania, in a very secular, very liberal, in many senses of the word, um, not that all those senses are, are bad or different from me, but just a very, uh, a world that is not, it's not my citizenship. Uh, so resident aliens generally, I suppose, do not attempt to uh, remake their host country and their image, but they do bear witness to where they're from. 
and they live consistently by it. And they're not, and in this sense of the word, I don't know that it's my job to go to France and tell them to all become Americans, but if the citizenship I have is in heaven, which is how Paul speaks of it, it, it belongs to the coming kingdom, then it's my job not to be shy about saying, this is good news. This way of life is good. Uh, and to commend that to my neighbors. And whenever my neighbors will partner with me on anything. You know, here's an interesting thing. I mentioned Sabbath. Our culture is realizing how much we lost by giving up Sabbath. I, I'm talking about our secular neighbors are saying, we can't do this 24-7 thing. You've got to take a break. And I think we could partner with our neighbors and say, you betcha. <laughs> like, you can't be human without a day off. Let's create workplaces. Let's create retail establishments. Let's create even laws, should the polity allow, that would actually reestablish a rhythm of work and rest in our culture. And I think our neighbors would, would seek that. Now, on other things, they're not going to agree with us. So we bear with us, I guess. Is that helpful? Is that on, sort of on point? Yeah. Um, Probably have time for two more. <laughs> I think uh, maybe it's more of a subtle, or at least an aside, uh, accomplishment that you have, uh, something you've accomplished with your book, is you have read your Bible as a whole. Oh, wow. As you, so. yes. You. I'd love to hear you talk about ways in which, if you agree or disagree with this, I suppose, but ways in which maybe contemporary American evangelicals don't read their Bibles as a whole, and perhaps ways in which your book is instructive as a model for that. Uh, wow. You know, by the way, uh, that's a fantastic question, and it relates to what we were just talking about. Because um, one of the things we've done is we've done a very bad job of reading the Old Testament <laughs> as part of our story. Uh, so we read everything through a a very narrow, we really mostly don't read the Old Testament. <laughs> and then we definitely don't read it as a guide for how to be a people in the midst of the peoples, how to be in the midst of nations which are much more powerful than us and have very divergent worldviews from ours, and yet be faithful to God uh, in that. And that, that is really the biblical story. The story is about this original good intention for image bearers, the ultimate reclaiming of that intention in the new heavens and new earth. And those, by the way, those are two things we often leave out. So we often have a Bible that begins in Genesis 3 and ends in Revelation 20, right? So we, we start out by talking about sin. Well, that's, you skipped two chapters, right? And then we end by talking about judgment, the lake of fire, Revelation 20. And again, you're skipping two chapters, Revelation 21 and 22, which are about the remaking of the world. So good news to good news. And then there's this story that's a the complicating of the story. And what happens in that, the whole Bible is a story of God intervening in the world so that his original intention will be fulfilled in the end. And Israel is a huge set of clues for us about what it means to be faithful in the midst of this human story. And they do it right sometimes, they do it wrong sometimes, just like we now, uh, the people of God, uh, in the, in the uh, constituted by the work of Jesus, we do it right sometimes and do it wrong sometimes. So we need to read the whole Bible and not mine it for little spiritual insights, but for kind of historical vision of what it means to be in the midst of history, which is just another way of saying culture through time. History is just culture over time. Um, and, and God's intention is to incarnate himself, first in Israel, then in Christ, then in Christ's body, the church, into history, not to separate people out from history, but put them into history, so that image bearing can be restored in the whole story. I think if we read the Bible that way, we'd actually find much more of the Bible interesting than we currently do. OK, um, I feel like we've touched on this in a couple of different areas, but more um, upon individuals and then individual Christians in reaction to our culture today. But um, my question was bringing it back to our personal church and bringing it back to our Sunday congregation um, and worship settings yeah. and how the church is kind of reacting with this struggle between how do we be cultural Christians um, and then the consuming, copying, condemning type yeah. of reactions to that. And so I see a lot of people um, dealing with that and realizing, you know, even just with the election, how these moral um, 
issues in our culture are affecting our church and how we define that as you know, a body of Christians. So my question is, how do we respond to the church kind of going back to some people saying like, no, we need to go back to liturgy, we need to go back to this, and then some mm. people going um, emergent or open theism or, mm. you know, what's that balance and what does that look like in our um, places of worship together? Wow. Well, I'm glad we ended with a nice small question because that, uh, <laughs> that's, there's so much there, and you you are seeing, even in the way you ask the question, you're seeing how complex this is. Let me just say maybe a couple things. Um, I think there's three ways Christians have made, at the church level, kind of the institutional level, have made massive mistakes in the past century that we would do well to avoid. And that's to give in to one of three or more than one of three things. Fear, grief, and envy. So let's go through those. Fear. It's so toxic when groups of Christians allow themselves to become afraid of the culture around them, even when there are legitimately things to fear. I mean, many of our Christian brothers and sisters around the world have much to fear. Uh, our, I mean, Egypt may have no Christians in 20 years. Uh, either because they will have left or they will have been killed. Uh, Iraq already has almost no Christians left. Even when there is something to fear, you cannot let your posture towards culture become defined by fear. And this is something that evangelicals are very tempted to. And certain moments concentrate it. And certain legislative things that go one way or another, or judicial things, cause us to, to retreat into fear. And I think that's that's very damaging, it, because the first thing God's messengers say when they meet God's people is, do not be afraid. Uh, even when there are things to fear, don't be afraid. Um, so if we build our, our culture, our sort of Christian subculture on fear, it's going to be very, very destructive. Grief. The fundamentalists were grieving their loss of cultural power at the beginning of the 20th century. Suddenly they weren't in charge anymore. The institutions they, their parents had started were taken from them by the modernist Christians. And out of grief, people, I mean, grief is a legitimate thing to feel. But uh, when it curdles, <laughs> it, it starts to cause you to, to react and become angry uh, and possessive and all kinds of things that just did not work for fundamentalism. <laughs> so we, it, let's suppose uh, there are things happening in our world. And, and if I made my list, it would be different from your list. And it would not be the list you might expect. But, there are things happening in our world and in our nation that cause me grief. I just think things are being lost that will take a long time ever to recover, if, if ever. And civilizations get lost. Whole empires disappear. If I let that start to, that sense of grief start to drive the way I act and create, I think I become much narrower. I need to hope in God. Grief is overcome by hope. And then envy. <laughs> this is seeing the wicked prospering. Seeing things kind of work if you give in to the way of the world. And saying, well, I think we could, we could make some accommodation to that. Because we'd really like some of that power, acceptance, approval, money, uh, status. And this is what misled my own, uh, my own Christian background as mainline Protestant. It's what misled huge chunks of mainline Protestantism in the 20th century. was envy of the way science seemed to be explaining everything about the world and becoming scientistic and just giving in and giving, giving away the idea that God was actually transcendent to the world. Uh, so fear, grief, and envy are very, uh, they're very real things. We should all recognize them when they're happening and let God deal with them in his way rather than letting them drive the way we relate to the culture. I hope that helps. Andy, thank you so much. Uh, would all of you join me in expressing our gratitude for his Thank you all. Thank you.